Western cedar is one of the few rough sawn rustic woods that you can find in your local lumber yard. When my wife and I bought our home, we were on a tight budget and Western cedar came to the rescue. These tables can be made so quickly that the joke in our house was that they could be made in five minutes or less. That, of course, wasn't true. But tables like these, despite being quickly made, have been useful and beautiful for many years. The rough sawn wood, complete with knots and imperfections, never goes out of style. When I later made finer furniture to replace them, we passed them along to others starting out in their first homes. The basic model is simply nailed together with pole barn nails. You can become more creative in your design. You could use larger exposed dowels to connect the parts or shape the base using a jigsaw or saw the edges of the top to a different profile. Simple, safe household chemicals can artificially weather your table, giving it an outdoor patina. And of course you can make other sizes. By simple changes in the lengths and widths, you can make tables for a variety of uses, both indoors and out. First, I cut the stock to length. I use a circular saw to cut the part to length, but a hand saw will work nearly as well. Using saw horses to hold the stock is an improvement over working on the ground, but don't let a lack of saw horses keep you from getting started. If you work on the ground, just lay scraps of wood underneath providing clearance for the blade. Begin by cutting all the parts to rough length. I cut them about an inch longer than the finished dimensions to allow for the ends to be accurately trimmed square. To square the ends, use a speed square held against the sides of the stock as a cutting guide. Hold the square tight to the stock while you hold the saw tight to the square aligning the blade with your line of cut. After you cut one end, turn the stock end for end, mark the stock to the exact length required, and align the speed square so that the saw blade aligns with the mark. If you're uncomfortable using the speed square and holding it with one hand and cutting with the other, you can use a clamp to lock the speed square in place. Now, rip the supports for the lower shelves from thinner three-quarter inch stock. This can be done with a hand saw or circular saw with a ripping guide. If you have a table saw, you could use that. Place your work on saw horses or on the ground with scraps of wood to lift it above the ground. I mark the angle at each end of the shelf support. I use a sliding T-bevel to make sure that they're both the same, but the angle is not really critical. Use a small hand saw to make the necessary cuts quickly and accurately. I use a Japanese Dazuki saw. You can leave your table very simple as shown here. Or you can use this as an opportunity to be creative. On this table, I've designed a cutout on the table ends using a jigsaw. The diamond shape here is laid out with a combination square. For this particular design, I measured two and a half inches in from each corner and marked the line with my combination square. And then directly from the corners, I marked again to form this inside cutout. With the jigsaw, you can make either straight or curving cuts. Use your imagination to see what you can come up with. You can make curving symmetrical shapes with scissors and folded paper. Inside cuts will take some time and greater care. Now it's time to assemble the base. I start with a little bit of a chamfer on that edge. I'll do the end grain first. And then Brush edges on the inside support should be sanded first. Use the carpenter square to align the shelf supports in place on the inside of the sides. You will find it helpful to get the nails partway driven into the stock 
before carefully placing it in position and then drive the nails through the support and into the sides. Carefully measure and mark the locations for the pole barn nails to attach the sides of the shelf. Then drill the holes for the nails. Use a drill bit slightly smaller than the diameter of the nails and drill all the way so the drill bit emerges on the other side. This will provide a pilot hole so that the nails will go in much more easily. Prop the side up so that it's easy to hold the shelf in position while nailing. A crate or cardboard box will do. Be careful that the shelf is tight to the support and equally spaced from the edges of the side. Then turn the parts over and follow the same procedure for nailing the other side in place. Use a small plane to lightly chamfer the edges of the leg holding the plane hewed at a 45 degree angle. And I'm just going to take a little sanding block in on some of these edges. The top is made of two pieces of 2x8 western cedar centered over the table ends and attached with more pole barn nails. Before attaching the top, use a block plane as you did before, held at an approximately 45 degree angle to chamfer the ends and sides of both top pieces. I prefer to chamfer more heavily on the bottom edges and plane more lightly on the top. Keep in mind th the need to do both sides the same. I count the strokes of the plane using the same number on each part to ensure equal chamfers. Leave the center edges where the two parts of the top will meet only lightly chamfered. Mark a center line on the sides to help with the positioning of the two top parts. Mark the location for the nails and drill pilot holes through the sections of the top. Use a carpenter square to help mark the holes accurately. Insert the nails in the pilot holes. Then align one half of the top and drive them in place. I leave a slight space between the two parts of the top. There are many ways to customize and personalize your rustic cedar tables. You can mix or match any of these ideas with your own. A coffee table takes a larger top and wider base, so it also requires a support for the top and beefier shelf supports. The sides are made with two 2x8s. Two I use one inch thick stock ripped to one and a half inch wide strips for the shelf supports. They also serve to connect the two side pieces together. You can use a circular saw set at a 45 degree angle to undercut the edges of the top. This will make the table top appear lighter. I clamp a guide piece to the parts of the top to guide the saw accurately. First cut the end and then the sides, leaving the edges that align in the middle of the table uncut. You can also add interest and craftsmanship to your tables by using large dowels to connect the parts. Assemble the table using wood screws in place of the pole barn nails. Then you can remove the screws one at a time and replace them with 7 8 inch dowels glued in place. 
You can give your tables an almost instant weathered rustic look by spraying them lightly with the diluted ebonizing solution. You can also turn them deep black by using the solution at full strength. Make the solution by taking one gallon of common household vinegar and dissolving a pad of four aught steel wool in it. Put the pad into the gallon of vinegar and let it steep for 24 hours. Be sure to test the strength of your mixture by putting a cup of solution in a plastic household sprayer and lightly wetting a piece of cedar scrap wood. As the solution dries, the color will turn gray then black. Add cups of water to dilute the solution for the desired effect. And now we'll just have to see what happens. It's always an experiment. Be sure that you have diluted the solution sufficiently before using on a finished table. The five board bench is an American country classic. It's utterly simple in design. Two ends, a top, and a front and back stretcher. When made with rough sawn lumber, it offers the opportunity to experiment with milk paints. You can paint one color over another and then sand lightly to exposed layers, giving a worn through the ages look and highlighting the interesting textures from the original milling. The project is also a great way to use woods with natural edges like this walnut hall table. Either variation is simple to make with hand or power tools. A few nails, screws, or dowels will offer all the strength required for many years of use. Begin by sanding your rough lumber smooth to the touch. The object here is to remove splinters but to leave the surface variations that resulted from the original milling of the wood. Use a random orbit sander with an 80 grit sanding disc. The object here isn't to make a perfect surface but to leave many of the marks that came from the original milling which will be an advantage later on as you'll see when I apply the milk paints. It is easiest to sand the boards before cutting them into parts. Use a circular saw with a speed square for a cutting guide to cut all the parts to length. The speed square, held tightly to the board with one hand, provides a good guide for the saw. If uncertain of your strength, use a C-clamp to hold the square in place. Scribe the cutout shape in the bench ends using a folded paper template. Hard stock or an old manila folder will be easy to trace with a pencil or pen. Simple curves or straight cuts are easiest for beginners and experienced woodworkers alike. Stack the legs for sawing so that both sides will come out identical. Clamp them securely or they may move against each other as you work. Cutting one at a time makes this less of a concern. I like to taper the legs slightly from the bottom to the top. It makes the bench appear lighter and more firmly rooted on the ground. I start one half inch from the top edge and mark a line to the bottom corner. Cut the taper with a circular saw following the line by eye. Lightly bump the edges with an angle grinder and sanding disc to add texture. To achieve a random surface, vary the angle and position, never staying long in one spot. You could choose to sand the edges smooth, but grinding fits with the other rough surfaces and will create a more rustic look when you apply milk paint. Mark the cutouts for the front and back stretchers to fit. Since the edges have been tapered, align the square referenced from the top of the legs. Clamp the board securely to your sawhorse, and with the legs clamped together, both parts can be cut at the same time. Okay. Cut along the marked lines with a handsaw. I use a Japanese pull saw. However, an American or European style hand saw or dovetail saw will work as well. 
turn the parts on their sides to finish the cutouts. To make the stretchers, I start with a circular saw and ripping guide. To avoid leaving cut marks in the sawhorses, you'll need to keep adjusting the position of the material and saw during the cut. Mark the decorative curves on the end of the stretchers using a folded cardstock template. Do that right. Yeah, like. Fold a piece of paper in half and then cut out the shape. You may find, as I have, that it's often easier to design with scissors than with a pencil. And with scissors, if you don't like the design you've come up with, cut again. I want to keep this natural edge here as much as I can in the finished bench. So I'm using that cut line there as my guide for using my template. And then I will measure over here to where the other side goes. Okay, so that will be one of my stretchers. Use a jigsaw to cut the part to shape. Use a sliding T-bevel and pencil or pen to mark the locations and angles for the legs on the front and back stretchers. Use the pencil lines on the stretchers to help align the parts so they can be clamped together for a trial fitting before assembly. Place the bench parts upside down on a flat surface. If the surface isn't flat, your bench may rock. And then drill pilot holes for screws. I drill the holes with a countersink bit, which allows me to hide the screws with 5 16 inch dowels. Do the same with the top. Okay. Cut the dowels about 5 16 inch longer than the depth of the hole, sand the ends, and glue them in place. Now it's time to begin applying the milk paint finish. After experimenting on scrap wood with a variety of color combinations, I decided to paint the first coat black to be followed with blue. Mix the black paint with water in the proportions stated in the instructions. Then brush it on. No primer is required. You'll work the paint into the recesses. Now I'll let this sit for a few hours and prepare for the next coat. Again, you want to be careful to cover the deeper recesses of the grain and texture. Use fine sandpaper to lightly sand the second coat after it dries. To sand through the, the top layer, and you'll see what happens is it reveals not only the color beneath, but it also reveals some of the wood grain beneath that. And so it actually gives a three color finish. And you want to particularly uh, sand the areas that would normally receive the most wear.
When you achieve the look you like, wipe down the bench to remove sanding dust. Then give the bench a clear coat for milk paint. This clear coat is an acrylic finish that's available from the milk paint company. It also uh, slightly darkens and brightens the colors that it goes over. Now blue over black may not be your favorite. The, uh, the great thing is that you can play with this in advance. The simple design of the five board bench can be applied to other styles of rustic furniture as well. This beautiful walnut hall table is just one example of that. To make this, I followed all the same steps as in making the five board bench with the following exceptions. I planed all the surfaces smooth, I added a lower shelf, and I used pocket screws hidden underneath to attach the top. This small table made with fresh cut sycamore twigs and branches would be perfect in an entry hall, a place to put a hat, purse, or keys and is made from materials harvested straight from the forest. One and a half inch thick stock cut from saplings forms the legs. A piece of one half inch plywood provides the foundation for a rich textured random mosaic on top. While this table is made of sycamore, other woods would work as well or even better. For example, willow has straight flexible branches that would be easier to arrange in a more uniform pattern. You'll notice that my pattern is not completely random. I like the way the twigs looked when cut at an angle on the ends, and I arranged them so that the ends formed a consistent pattern around the perimeter of the top. While this is a rustic project, it really starts with a piece of half-inch plywood. The half-inch plywood is a point to which you attach the legs. It is also the space on which you construct the mosaic top. First cut the plywood top to size. This can be done with a table saw or a handheld circular saw or even with a hand saw. The four legs of this table were cut from a single sapling and the slight variation in thickness makes very little difference in the finished work. Use a hand saw to cut the legs to length. First I'm going to square up the end before I do any measuring. And now I can measure for my first leg. I'm going to cut this part off here and discard it so that I can keep the diameter similar. It's just a little larger than I want. And I have two legs and I'm working on number three. Okay, four legs. Use screws to attach the tabletop to the legs. Clamping the top to a sawhorse will help to hold the legs in place while you drive the screws. And I want to adjust it so it flares out a little bit at the bottom before I get it located in its final position. I can turn it and compare how I like to look at it. Let me pre-drill that. I use two and a half inch long exterior deck screws to secure the legs. Now I can uh, deal with these little t uh, twigs later. Okay. 
Now I can still do a little bit of adjustment in here in terms of how I put on my uh, stretchers. And this will get trimmed off, this will get trimmed off. And at this point I want to just kind of look at it from different angles because I can still turn things slightly if I need to to get the best look. Paint the plywood top using spray paint. Trying to mask things off to prevent overspray getting on the legs. It doesn't matter your paint color exactly as long as it's dark enough to provide shadow where the branches fit, so it could be black or brown. Okay. Now it's time to create the top mosaic. First cover the edges with thin branches. I cut miters where the branches meet in the corners. and use a nail gun to attach the branches in place. Carefully trim the branches to fit using pruning shears. If your branches are irregular in shape, you can make things easier by cutting them in short pieces laid end to end. Pay close attention to the placement of your fingers to avoid accidents. The reason I'm cutting them so small is to be able to fit them tight. There's so much irregularity in the, uh, in the branches themselves. Now, um, some woods actually fit quite a bit easier. For example, willow is very flexible and much more uniform in dimension than this uh, sycamore. So you have to adapt to whatever materials you have available. Okay, I have a little bump right there that I can fix with a knife. Bring it in just a little closer. So I carve that little bump away. And get a better fit. Now I want to start dividing the top into areas that I can create a random mosaic. Place branches in a random pattern and gradually attach one after another. At this point, I just simply try to fit in little pieces and gradually fill out the mosaic. One of the uh, objectives that I have is to have the end grain revealed all the way around because it creates an interesting pattern. And so, and I try to cut the end grain so that it is kind of at a miter like that on the outside but I can lay pieces in this way, all different directions. So with every branch, I kind of test it to see how it fits in best because each of these has a natural curvature, so I can take advantage of that natural curvature. And if I have, have a piece that is too uh, crooked, I can just uh, put it aside and avoid it. The first thing I'm gonna do is trim up this side so it fits there, so I'll just take my nippers and check, and that looks adequate. So then I'll take it over here and I'm just going to check by eye 
and see where that's going to go. And of course, I cut it too long, which is better than too short. So I can take it and I'm going to recut. And I can still just take a very slight amount more. Okay, now I'm ready to nail. So I'll hold it, make sure my fingers are out of the way. I hold the gun at an angle so that the nail won't go through to the other side. And then I'm ready for my next piece. You'll find that green or freshly cut material will be much easier to work with than dry wood. When wood dries, the cell walls harden, making it harder to cut. Two cuts are actually better than one. Cut twigs just a bit long and then make a second cut. The second, removing just a small amount of material, will give a cleaner cut and a more refined and accurate look to the finished table. Gradually fill the space on the top, stick by stick. I arrange pieces so that a pattern of cut tips is formed around the perimeter of the tabletop. Cut pieces to fill the corners, too. There is no exact pattern to follow. Just cut and fill until the entire top is covered. Next, strengthen the legs on the table by adding stretchers to the outside. These added parts are required to make the table stable and strong. I use branches slightly thicker than the material used for the mosaic pattern on top, and nails driven in place with a nail gun are sufficient to hold them securely in place. Cut the branches to a length equal to the width and depth of the table. I choose my nail length so it'll pass through the stretcher and into the leg without going through. I use two or more nails to attach each end and angle each nail slightly different from the others to provide additional resistance to pulling out. Okay, I'm going to trim this off so I can nail this piece in here. And I'm going to mark this for trimming here. I have to put shorter nails in. And I need to trim that a little bit with, with a knife or a saw.
I cut the legs to length. So I'll sand slightly around the edges and then nail in the three-point glides. It's easy to add an oil finish. I use a spray bottle because it gives more uniform coverage. You can also use polyurethane spray. With an oil finish, you want to come back 20 to 30 minutes later with a dry cloth and dab off any excess. Then let it sit for 24 hours and it'll be ready for use. Tables of this type can be made in any size or shape and round tables are particularly appealing. This one was made with green walnut sticks and twigs. Putting the twig edge around the top requires that you use material that is fresh cut and flexible in order to bend a shape without breaking. The legs in this variation are strengthened through the use of stretchers forming an X connecting them. They're held in place with screws. For the sake of variety,